I was probably in the second or third grade, I, I was crying. I went to my mom's room and she's like, uh, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong, baby? And I said, I don't want to go to jail. And she's like, why would you go to jail? And I say to her, doesn't all men have to go to jail? <gasps> well, because that's what my life was. What's up, pod fam? Welcome back. Happy Wednesday. I am so excited for this one. So excited. So again, I, every week. <laughs> but okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something. We it's it's we're always excited, but it's different reasons why we're excited. Totally. Always high levels of excitement, but like I feel like we have a different reason each time. So for people who are being like Oh, they're always excited. Well, I want to live my life excited. Also, I really hope you guys don't ever expect us to come on here and be like, happy Wednesday. <laughs> Not a great episode, but here you go. <laughs> Rough one this <laughs> week. Fair, fair. Okay, so I was, I was so excited about having this guest on because I met him in 2018 at an event we were doing with Coca-Cola and immediately was just like, so insanely impressed by him and his demeanor and just everything about him, how kind he was, how humble, but also what he had achieved in, in his sport. So when we reached out to him and he was equally as excited about coming on, I was just like over the moon yeah. about it. So today we have Paralympian Roderick Townsend on the podcast. Rod has one, okay, let me just get this right, the high jump for the past three consecutive Paralympic Games. So he won in Rio, he won in Tokyo, and he just won this past summer in Paris. He is the world record holder in the event. He also competes in long jump as well. But he started in the Paralympic movement in 2015 and has literally won every major championship meet since 2015. So we talk about it in the podcast, but if he goes to Worlds next year and wins, that is a decade, decade of standing on top of the podium, which is just like so unbelievable. And I feel like there was so much in here that we absolutely loved, but I love how we were able to talk about his background, which yes. it was, I, I don't think we have had someone come on and just like jump in and be that vulnerable and share so much from their past just right out of the gate and stuff yeah. that is a lot like a lot so and heavy yes and he just gets right into it with us and that just immediately like I was like oh my gosh this is gonna be amazing yeah I feel like it just opened the floodgates like yes. he just and, and that's just so credit to him like it was nothing yeah. we did he just opened it up and I'm just so in awe of you know his his mom and his family and, and you'll hear him talk about it but just the perspective and gratitude and presence in the face of that. Yes. I mean, I know his mom kicked it off, but he he kind of was humble about it. I feel like he was like, yeah. well, it's my cousin, my mom. It's like, no, but Lee, you had to, you know, internalize that and inherit that. And I'm just so curious about when people are able to do that in the, mm. in the face of hardship. So to hear him talk about that, I know was a big takeaway for me of just having understanding of what's going on and being like, okay, I'm in a pretty awesome position right now. Yes. And I feel like we both love this act that he has as like the bad boy. Love it. We love it because it, it really is an act. Like he yeah. was even saying like, it's something that he uses to amp him up and get him really ready to compete. But at the end of the day, he is the most genuine guy. He is so sweet. So he is so respectful. And he understands the bigger picture. Yeah. And I think that's the coolest part about his story. And we get into this so much is how he has been passing it on with yeah. his entire career and how he's introduced other athletes to the Paralympic movement. And in Tokyo, he had one of his athletes get silver behind his gold in Paris this past summer, his athlete won gold in T63. And it was just, and that was Ezra. And it was just like, so amazing to hear how he is simultaneously competing and ha having such success and coaching and his athletes are having such yeah. success. Like it's so they he, they're literally coach athlete duos winning gold at the Paralympic games. Yeah. And I, I, we didn't, 
I didn't ask him this, but I, I kind of know the answer. It's like, how do you manage that emotion? Right. Like, because I always say like coaches have their own set of emotions when they're watching their athletes compete nerves and so freaking out about what's about to happen. And, you know, and I'm like, I can't imagine going to a Paralympic Games, not only nervous for your own performances, but then thinking about the athlete that you're, you know, like that's just so much. How and does one person do? How do, how do you not explode? But it, when you listen to or watch the episode, you realize how, like, he's just yeah. so good at looking at what's in front of him and going, okay, like, this is what it is. I have my performance and then I have his performance. And just like, he called himself out so many times in these moments. And again, going back to the presence, how do you in that moment recognize what's going on? Like my favorite part of him talking about what he said to himself in the Paris final was wild. I know. I'll tease it. I won't say it. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just such a cool situation too, because his wife, Ty, also competed for Team USA and they had their son, Rodney, who's just about to turn one. So also so beautiful to hear his perspective as a currently competing athlete and a parent and how that's changed things for him. So there's just so much in this conversation, you guys. I think you're really going to love it. And if this is your first introduction to Roderick, you're going to be just as in love as as Katie and I are, and there's still so much to come from him, which is so exciting, but this was an amazing conversation. And without further ado, here is your weekly episode of Unfiltered Waters with Roderick Townsend. Dream Recovery has been a longtime sponsor, and there is a major reason why. Missy and I use just about every single product that they have, from their silk pillowcases to their incredible eye masks to their Dream Tape, and now their Dream Tape Plus, we cannot get enough. The tape is secure, And it comes off super easy in the morning. And y'all know me, I am all about efficiency. So the fact that I'm knocking out some of my lip skincare routine, as well as getting an awesome night rest, check, check all the boxes, and I love it. The benefits of mouth taping are really extensive. And since using it in the last year, I have fallen asleep faster, increased my REM sleep, aka the ability to recover well, and found myself waking up just so much more well rested. If you're nervous, I get it. They have their dream strip which is just a smaller one, but just as effective to allow you to experience the incredible benefits. So in this busy world, why would you not take such an easy step to optimize your life? So we've got a special code for you. It's code unfiltered to give you 30% off your first order or 50% off your first subscription of Dream Tape or Dream Tape Plus. Sleep well. Hello, Unfiltered Waters family. We are so excited to welcome the one, the only, three-peat Paralympic champion, Roderick Townsend, to the podcast. What's up, Rod? Hey, hey, hey. How's everybody doing today? (laughs) We are so excited to have you here. I met you at a Coca-Cola event many years ago, which has been so Mm -hmm. fun being able to work with you through that and was just so insanely impressed by your kindness, your humility, but also your storytelling and just your story is so incredible. What you've accomplished is so incredible. So we really think that this is just going to touch so many people. So thank you so much for having us. Before we get started, we talked about this a little, but we have to share with everyone. It was recently Halloween. Your son is about to turn one. So it was your first Halloween with your son. How was your first trick-or-treating experience and what did you guys dress up as? Oh, it was a lot of fun. So we've been uh, binge watching Mm X-Files, just finished that up actually. And my wife was Scully, the FBI agent, and my son and I were actually aliens who had been captured by her. Um, (laughs) Which It it was a really fun day. Yeah, exactly. It was a, was a, a really fun day. He loved his costume, which we weren't expecting at all. I thought he was gonna hate it. He just started walking and um he doesn't typically like to have anything on his feet and the costume comes with feet. So I thought he'd hate it, but he, he, he was really happy to have the costume on actually. How far did you guys make it on your Halloween trek? Cause I had a ton of trick or treaters and there was like little ones and I'm like, there's no way you're making it more no. than five or six houses. <laughs> yeah. No. So we, um, we have a family friend who lives out in surprise, Arizona, and they had a little, uh, family get together so we just went over there and everybody wore our costumes and just hung out went to a couple houses near them and that was it really so not too much because he's not eating candy yeah it's like for you i know whenever that they come up i'm like 
Okay, this is for you guys. Like, don't act the like you're not. The goal is to show <laughs> people how cute my child yeah, is. Yeah, That's just exactly. On a daily basis, how can I get him in front of people? <laughs> I'm, I've somebody never... asked me it. Somebody asked me the other day, "Oh, is this number one?" And I was like, "Yep, he is number one." <laughs> you said it. We'll stay that way. <laughs> Be best right here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I've never been a huge fan of Halloween, and having a daughter for me has been such a game changer. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. just, it has been so magical as she's three this year Two, mm -hmm. She like kind of got it, but not really this year. She got it. Oh, she like got she it. was, so she kept calling it trick or treat in. So, yeah. and then she couldn't understand that it was just that one night. So every time we yeah. leave a house, oh. she'd be like, thanks. See you tomorrow for more oh. trick or treat in. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably like, please come back. We have tons of leftovers. And I was like, I'm yeah. just going to let you believe this. This is so cute. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, uh, and I don't know this yet, but I feel like all the holidays get restored. So true. Like oh, birthdays yeah. and Christmas and, and all of them. So I'm looking forward to that. Which speaking of, yeah. you're, you said your t son turns one on Sunday. Do you guys have yeah. a big one-year-old party planned? Not a big party, which is crazy coming for me because I love hosting. I love doing all of that. Um, we are, I, I did get a, a bounce house oh, uh, with that'll a slide be a and stuff like that. And um, just some cupcakes. There's uh, so much good food out here. There's yeah. a place in Arizona called Small Cakes, and we typically have them do all of the catering for birthdays and stuff. And just having some people over the house, just keeping it low key. Um, because I have so much stuff going on. I'm always building something or renovating this or doing that. And I'm just like, okay, if I try to do too much for the birthday party, then that's going to, I'm not even going to get to enjoy it. So just taking it uh, one day at a time. <laughs> Wait, I didn't know this about you and I probably should, but you're saying you're a big DIY guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that started during COVID actually. We bought a house in uh, 2020 and I remember just having all this free time and things cost a lot to fix. And I was like, well, how about, you know, I try to do it myself. And if I fail, then I can always pay somebody to fix it. Um, but we ended up gutting and redoing an entire house, like down to the studs. Wow. The only thing I didn't do was the electric because that's not something. Yeah, that's uh, not, yeah, not, not something we want to DIY. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm really big into, you know, any type of woodworking as well as what I've uh, been doing a lot of. So making, furniture and you know right. just cabinets and drawers and stuff like that it's a lot of fun to me a lot of fun i have so, awesome. so much respect for people who can do that I like do. i just feel like <laughs> i do task rabbit they come they do it <laughs> but like it's not because i don't try yeah. but like it's mm -hmm. just a skill set but that's so cool um well i want to journey back a little bit in your story and, and talk about your upbringing a little bit um and just the hardships you experienced mm -hmm. um and just as much as you're willing to share about your disability and just your mm -hmm. upbringing in your town yeah, it's it's um really exciting because I actually got the chance for the first time to speak back home in Stockton, California, oh. and it was it was great. Uh, part of the reinvent South Stockton uh, coalition is what it's called, and being from South Stockton specifically myself, it was great to be able to go back and to be able to speak in an event that was so important to the people of Stockton and South Stockton specifically, with my uncle running for a uh, city councilman for South Stockton as well. I thought it was a really great opportunity to be able to have all of that kind of have the stars align, especially coming back from the games. And for myself, my mom was 15 years old when uh, she found out she was pregnant with me. And she, like I tell people, is always been such a big motivator for me. I've never been the type of person to have a favorite athlete. I've always just really loved the authenticity of hard work. Mm. And, and my mom instilled that in me, my uncle instilled that in me because the, where they are today, they should not be. If you just look at the statistics, you know, my mom was 15 years old. We were homeless. We didn't have anything, but I never knew that when I was young, she wow. provided me with so much love and she, I, 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 I grew up, I never had to miss a meal. Mm -hmm. And for myself, I knew that if I were to be anything but great, it would do all of her hard work a disservice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I know that I was born with a disability um, and there were going to be certain hardships that I had to face 
being that I had a single parent, but I, I don't think that compares at all to what my mom had to endure to be able to make these opportunities available to me. We just got off the phone today and we're talking about possible, you know, charter schools that I want to send my son to or private schools mm -hmm. where they teach foreign languages and this and that. And I say to my mom, it's crazy that you've made it possible for me to have these be my concerns wow. is what schools are going to give the most opportunities to my son. Because for myself, when I graduated from college, my uncle doesn't say much that isn't just hilarious. You know, he, <laughs> he's this is the, probably the only time I ever seen him cry. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, you know, we just wanted to see you live long enough to graduate from high school because that was a, a real concern. My uncle lost his leg uh, to, you know, gang violence when he was 15. Um, so I've always been around people who are a living testament of what it means to go through the thick of it. So I always pride myself in being able to learn from other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. I knew that gangs, you could possibly end up losing your life or losing a limb because I've seen that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time when I was probably in the second or third grade, I was crying. I went to my mom's room and she's like, uh, oh, what's wrong? What's wrong, baby? And I said, I don't want to go to jail. And she's like, why would you go to jail? And I say to her, doesn't all men have to go to jail? <gasps> well, because that's what my life was. That's what you saw. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's so great to be able to have my son be able to live this life due to sacrifices that my mom made for me to be able to make it this far in life. And it's crazy because when I did graduate from college and I did have a sense of there was more for me to do. Because like I said, my mom, my uncle sacrificed so much for me to be able to not just live, but to, to thrive. And I went and got my master's degree and while I was doing so, I remember uh, that that was that was my first year competing in Paralympic track and field. And people always ask, what are you what do you think when you're on top of the podium? Like, how does it feel? And, you know, Missy, mm -hmm. you, nothing can ever prepare you for what emotions you're going to go through on top of the podium and what you're going to think about. Is it going to be all the training? Is it going to be this? And and it's always something different. But I'll never forget that the first time I was on top of the podium, I felt like a weight was 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 lifted from my shoulders because I felt like all her hard work was worth it at that moment. And it was so comforting to be able to know that the single mother from Stockton, California, who shouldn't have made it as far as she did, you know, was able to make this a possibility. So all the all all of my story is just a, you know, a side note, a footnote in hers, because she's just truly powerful and and very hardworking, and she carries herself self with such grace that just really pushes me and motivates me. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Like literally, yeah. we could just end the interview right here, and I'd be like, <laughs> okay, I'm ready to go run through a brick wall now. I know, <laughs> I, but you bring up such a good point. Like Katie and I talk about that all the time. Of like, we right, we just as you said, we get that question all the time. Of like, what is that feeling when you've reached the pinnacle of your sport? And your answer actually reminded me of Katie's, where it was more a sense of relief. Yes, and mm -hmm. and that was yeah. when hearing all of that. You you talk about this pressure that you almost put on yourself because you know the people. Mm -hmm that you loved had given up so much to give you so much opportunity. How did you balance that pressure you were putting on yourself to, to make them proud? Did that ever feel like too much or did it feel like a privilege that you were able mm -hmm. to go out there and chase these opportunities that they had helped get for you? Yeah, it's a, a great question because it, it, it still ties into that Rio 2016, yeah. you know, moment because at that time, as I mentioned, I was coaching at Northern Arizona University while also pursuing my master's degree. And I'll never forget, I got a call or an email saying that, hey, the bus schedule changed and I had to be on an earlier bus to get to the track. But I also had to make a call, like a, a Zoom call to a recruit in Germany. And I had to, and I had to at the same time, 
write an essay. Like I had to, I had to finish an assignment oh my for my uh, graduate school program. <laughs> and I remember sitting there stressing out. I was stressing out. And, and I said to myself, I can't believe I have to finish this assignment, make a recruiting call and then go compete. And now I just found out that the bus is leaving sooner than I planned. And, and I was just going through it. And after about 20 minutes, I just started to laugh because I was repeating this to myself. I was like, dude, you are over here complaining about just blessings at this point. You are doing a job that you love, that's providing a, a free education for you. And you're about to go compete on the biggest stage of your life. Just just take it for what it is, you know, just appreciate the moment and I try to remind myself that when I do feel overwhelmed is it's typically from things that I've prayed for. It's typically for things that, that I've always wished would be a reality. So when days like today happen and it's, Oh, I got a call with uh, unfiltered water. <laughs> and then I have to take my son to a doctor's appointment. And then I have to finish building the deck. It's, I get to talk with people that, you know, I'm very close to because I was able to accomplish something great this year. I get to take my son to a doctor's appointment today for his, you know, and, and, and I get to finish doing some work around the house that I bought and I love to live in. And mm. so often we have to rephrase the way that we think of things. And I say that because uh, the initial question of, you know, how, how do I deal with the pressure? It's really just reminder, reminding myself that that the pressure is what I want. Um, mm -hmm. and, and all aspects of my life because of the fact that it's, it's really only what you make it. And I know that I'm fighting for things that I've always wanted to have. And, and I'm just continuing to just make the most of op all the opportunities that I've been uh, granted. I love that. And I think it's that mentality of I get to versus I have to. And I think mm -hmm. that takes an extreme amount of presence in the moment. Because I know I've yes. been in situations where it's like, you look back and you're like, Dane, why did I stress about that? Like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm sitting here living this super blessed life, but it's really hard to have that. The fact that you did it 20 minutes in yes. is mm -hmm. commendable. <laughs> is that something that your mom ever verbalized to you? Or was it just her mm -hmm. example of how she carried out her life? Mm -hmm. Um, honestly, I think that it was just more of a, a self-realization mm -hmm. than anything, um, because it wasn't anything negative and it wasn't even a matter of myself. Com it wasn't even a matter of me comparing myself to other people in their situations and, oh, it could be so much worse. No, it was just, wow, you're, you're living your dream right now. It's just that sometimes uh, you know, <laughs> as the Bible says, you know, your, your cup will overflow. And yep. what do you do when that cup starts to overflow? Oh, wait, let me, <laughs> oh, <I> gotta... <laughs> it's not, you're not calm. No. When that cup overflows. Frantic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it was just a matter of realizing that like, okay, I gotta, gotta put a lid on this thing. <laughs> um, and, and there are so many opportunities in my life that I get a chance to sit back and reflect. And I just try to be as present and as patient with things as possible. And I'll, I'll in this year specifically, because every games is different. Every, every year is different. My, my whole mindset was just being appreciative of, mm -hmm. of just every moment because yeah, I'm 32 now. This is my third games. And some days I really didn't want to do it. And I just had to remind myself, well, if this is your last year doing it, what do you want it to look like? Do you want to resent the moments or do you want to appreciate the moments? Mm. And just just taking it, you know, in stride and just just truly loving the process and, and just being as um, slow with things as possible, basically, mm. just just getting through the days and, and just it, it, it felt so much different to get to the village and to have all of the gear. And no, I want to I want to wear Team USA, everything, 100% of the time. I want to be, yeah, you guys want to vote for me? Yes, I want to be the team captain. Like, just, <laughs> these are opportunities that you just can't, you know, uh, expect to happen again. And I think that a lot of that was due to my son being here and just allowing me to just truly slow down and, and appreciate 
every day that I have with him. And it's just made me so much better as a, as a person, as a, as a, as a coach, as a son, as a brother. And, and I just love the appreciation that I have for things now, simply because I am trying to see things through his eyes and know that for him, he's just loving the days, the the time that he gets to spend with me. And he, he doesn't want anything to, but to be with me and to be with his mom and just trying to simplify things in that way has been very helpful for me and my personal, you know, ambitions and goals. Yeah, we can all be so reminded of those perspectives and the importance of, I love the idea of just slowing down and there, there's so much you've already touched on that I'm like, oh, we're going to go back to that. Oh, we're going to go I back know, to same. that. Too. Like pin, pin, <laughs> pin, pin, pin. <laughs> we're going to go back to Rio. We're going to go back to fatherhood. But one thing too, we wanted to talk about kind of as you were growing up is so for those that don't know, you have permanent nerve damage to your right arm and shoulder due to your umbilical cord being wrapped around your neck at birth. So you compete in T47 Paralympic track and mm-hmm. field. But for the majority of your growing up, you were competing with able-bodied people. And I just was so fascinated reading so many of the quotes that you, you had in other interviews. And one of them that really stuck with me was when you said, I have a disability that most people aren't even aware of. And I told people that I didn't even have a disability because I didn't see it as one. My question with that is, what was that acceptance process like for Mm -hmm. you? And then what would you say to anyone who is currently struggling with not accepting who they are? Yeah, I for for myself, it was um, there. there There's a lot of people who don't recognize that I have a disability. Um, They just can't notice it. Um, And there are other people who it stands out to. They're like, oh, I, I thought some, you know, it's just a matter of how you perceive and see things. There, there are certain people um, who just don't pay that close attention to things, um, which there's nothing wrong with. But I've, I've always been a loud person who likes to talk, who likes to make jokes. I've never taken myself too seriously. Um, so yeah, I've been made fun of a lot, but only because I'm dishing it out as well. You know, it's just me hanging out with my friends and, you know, we're just you got you know how guys can be sometimes where it's like just how we show love to one another yes. um so i've um always been accepted but i think that's primarily because of the fact that i don't want to say that i didn't allow my disability to slow me down but that was essentially what i was trying to do was hey i i i got to make sure that that I, that I'm not trying, I, because at the end of the day, there's no excuses. I've just lived my life that way. I, nobody cares, which there are some people who do care, but at the end of the day, when you're playing football and you line up, nobody cares mm. that you have a disability. It, that's, that's not what we're here to do, you know? So just always making sure that, that, um, I was going to play the deck of cards that I was dealt. And, and that was just my ambition. And that's what, that's what drove me for a really long time. But when I got to college, at uh, Boise State, I remember I would do a, a three-point stance all the time, and because I was a decathlete, so I had to do you know block starts. And my coach says to me, "Have you? Why do you do a three-point stance?" I was like, "I can't," because you know my arm. He was like, "Oh, okay." So have you tried to do a traditional four-point start though? And I was like, "Actually, I haven't." And he was like, okay, well, let's try to make some modifications and see if we can do it. We made some modifications and I was able to do it. And it was really impactful for me in that moment because it wasn't until then that I started to accept my disability, primarily because in any other aspect of our life, we want to recognize our weaknesses so that we can strengthen them. Mm. And especially as an athlete, we can't look at it any differently. Okay. Mm -hmm. I could tell people, oh, I can do everything that someone else can do. I can't. And that's okay. Let's make it optimal for myself. Mm. And in doing so, recognizing that disability, we can strengthen things in a way that we otherwise wouldn't. So a lot of the lifts, a lot of the things that I do are adaptive to to uh, take into account my disability. And I, I feel like since recognizing that in, in, in my training, we find new ways to do this all the time. And I've been working with uh, Jeff Peters Meyer, my coach, since 2011. So 13 years now. Amazing. And 
he's not the same coach today as he was two years ago or as he was five years ago. He's always dynamically, you know, changing things and we're growing as a, as a team. And I think that it's phenomenal to continue to find new ways to, to take my disability into account. And it's not something that should be shied away from if I truly want to be great. We, we can't hide, uh, we can't hide our weaknesses. Um, they're always going to show up in one way or another, whether we like it or not. And it's only a matter of just truly recognizing them that allows you to be able to strengthen them. So I think that for a lot of people in my position specifically, it can be really tough to vocalize that you have a disability because some people are going to feel as if you're not disabled enough. And when doing a sport or doing Paralympic track and field, athletes like Nick Mayhew, Isaac John Paul, and myself, we can catch a lot of flack because people feel as if we're cheaters because we're not as disabled as other people who we, in fact, don't even compete against. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> because like as you mentioned, as you mentioned, you know, I'm a, I'm a high jumper. I compete against other athletes with arm impairments. Um, and there are some things in a day-to-day -day life that are easier for me having two arms, but there are a lot of things that I do in the sport of track and field specifically that makes it really tough when, when you can only lift your arm this high, yeah. it's really tough to be able to fully extend how a traditional high jumper would. Um, and not to make excuses, but it's just the reality of the situation. So I think that it's great that there are athletes like Nick Mayhew, Isaac John Paul, and myself who are truly embracing our disabilities because there are so many people out there like us who only need to see it to know that it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question on just that using people doubting and haters and difference mm -hmm. as fuel. And you've been very vocal about kind of being the bad boy, which... Mm -hmm. I, again, I wish I could have been like the like controversial, like Lily King of swimming one. I just don't have it in me. I just don't. Um, I'd, I'd go home and cry every single day, but I, I, I would, you know, but I, I think I admire that. And I, and I wonder when you think about using that fuel, number one, mm -hmm. like, did you, were you always able to do that? Like from the very start? And number two, do you feel like it gives you a little bit of a, you know, kind of that chip on your shoulder, which I think personally can be a superpower? Yeah, I, I feel like I, I love it. I'm, I tell people all the time, I'm here to put on a show. Ugh. Plain and simple. I want when people leave, when when people are no longer, you know, in Paris because their vacation is over, they've they've gone home. And they're telling their family, and they're saying, oh, what was your favorite part about being in Paris? That they mentioned me. Mm -hmm. That they mentioned, oh, this guy's hair was crazy. He got the crowd <laughs> involved. It was so insane watching him jump and the way that he, because that's something you can't practice for. I'm, when I'm out there, it's mm -hmm. it's really just, I I, I grew up watching WWE, uh, WWE oh, WWF. Yeah. Who's I, your favorite? I was a huge Stone Cold Steve Austin. Obviously. Easy, easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and and I love the way he carried himself specifically because he was the bad guy. Yeah. But people loved him for it. And and I was one of the people that loved him for it. So when I am competing, that's that's what I want to you know, bring about. I want people to have an emotion because for a lot of people this is a myself included, this is a a huge deal. It's it's not easy to fly all the way across the world to watch a competition. And if somebody's doing so, I want them to be able to feel like that whatever they paid for that ticket was worth it because they got to see me compete. And it's fun because it's so authentic. Not everybody can do it. But we have, for example, my biggest competitor, Nisha Kumar. He is an Indian high jumper. And I've won every major championship in high jump since I've started uh, Paralympic sport in 2015. So winning in 2025 would mark a decade, literally, oh, of absurd. winning every <laughs> single one. But world championships is in India. Oh, so wow. for me, for me, it's awesome because it's a great competitor. But I get to truly be myself. I get to. I I hope they boo me. Like <laughs> I love that. I love it. I, I tell people all the time that when I say that I'm the bad guy, it's because I don't want anybody else to win. I want to be the reason when when people tell their story, they have to mention me. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, and, and, and 
it's it's fun because of the fact that I, I have so much respect for my competitors. I didn't I didn't feel this way initially, but then everybody started getting so much better that I started to take offense to it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like actually annoyed. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. Like, it, it, it makes no sense. No, I get it. And I get only, it. Only athletes will understand. Yeah. Like, yeah. how dare you try? <laughs> so true yeah you're like oh now i have yeah i think that you need to make it normal to have a wwe like entrance (laughs) right i mean is there a time limit that you have when you when you parade out for finals no there is not actually loophole not and and what's a lot of fun is uh, a lot of times during the indoor season i competed a lot of uh indoor you know high jump only competitions and they'll ask hey what songs do you want us to play while you're jumping so oh, fun. i get opportunities to yeah it's so what much are your fun. what are your and, go-to and it, songs um it really depends yeah. like uh last year one of my favorite songs to jump to because we it's typically like six competitions and all i can do is give them a playlist and then say hey play you know whatever song like i don't know exactly how i'm feeling until the moment comes but uh one of them last year was uh Suave, it was a it was a mix on Suavemente, oh, which was spicy. really really cool. And <laughs> the year before that, I think that um, it was Bad Boys by Shine. It's just literally, you know, yeah. I I give them so many songs. Be- most people only give them one or two songs, but I know that I'm extra. I'm not sure how I'm gonna feel, so I'm the guy. Okay, wait, play this one, and okay, now I feel it. Now I feel it. <laughs> you know, um, but. This upcoming year, I'm not sure what I'm what I'm really feeling. I've been listening to a lot of, I it it it's funny that you guys asked because I was literally uh, talking to my brother, and I was like, hey, when I go to those um competitions this year, I'm probably going to be jumping to some like Triple H theme music or something like that. <laughs> I just I don't know what. So like some of those are definitely going to be on the playlist. And if I hear that Stone Cold Steve Austin glass shatter, that might be exactly what that sets could me be off. Yeah. perfect. So, so yeah, I'm uh, yeah. I'm so love envious it, of it. that. Can you imagine if we were swimming and we got to like I, the last used 50? To be, we used to be able to pick our walkout songs. No, we could pick our walkout songs, but like during, oh, like during, I know, during, yeah, I know. like that's it so was, sick. Yeah, it's so, cool. it's so hype, especially when the like I, I always get a lot of because I I listen to so much different type of music and like a lot of the artists that I like, whether they be low key or, or unknown or just random mixes, like people don't expect to hear something good that they haven't already heard before. Mm. So it's really cool to be out there at those competitions and people are like, Oh wow. What was that? And I get a lot of compliments on my music choice because, but only because I'm so extra. Most people just choose one song <laughs> and people know that when I'm jumping, they're going to get a whole playlist. Yeah. Of- <laughs> it's like a whole concert <laughs> while watching yeah. you jump. <laughs> Exactly. Well, before exactly. we move on, Rod, too, one thing I'd like, I have to vocalize this and get this out because this is so much of what Katie and I were talking about when we were doing prep for this interview, is we love that you're both. You are mm. both the bad guy that has this amazing, like, intensity, it wants to be the reason other people lose, and yet you are the nicest, most respectable <laughs> man. Like, and so I just, I feel like people oftentimes feel like they need to choose between those mm-hmm. two things. And so I just want to recognize that. I think it's really amazing that you hold space for both. You're ultra competitive. You want to be that bad boy in the sport. You want to have this kind of this image and you want to bring the hair and the excitement and the music and the crowd, but you're also just so genuine. And I think that that's really amazing. So thank you for being a really good example of thank that you. as well. Thank you. It means a lot to hear from you. <laughs> well, it really does. I'm, I've, I, I, and I've told uh, my agent this a bunch, and I've told a lot of people this. I don't know if I've ever told you this, though, Missy. When we did meet uh, in like 2018 yeah. at Coke HQ, I got a chance to hear you speak as well, and I was like, "She's awesome. Like that's exactly what I want to do." But. I, I, I've always known how, you know, dominant you were in sport, obviously, but that, like I told you before, that's not necessarily what motivates me. Mm-hmm. What motivates me is, you know, other things and whether it be Lex Gillette. So anytime I give a speech, for example, I listen to Lex Gillette. He has this TED Talk. Because I'm a competitor, I listen to his TED Talk first, and then I imagine that now I have to go speak after he's done speaking Ooh, that's <laughs> because cool. I'm like, I, I need to 
compete, you know, um, but Lex Gillette and, and yourself, you've always been uh, very uh, an inspiration to me in, in a sense of like, what do I want my life after track and field to look like? How, how do I want to continue to uh, not compete, but what is going to continue to fuel me? Mm -hmm. um, and hearing you talk, I definitely felt a lot of um, not inspiration, but I, I felt like you were really enjoying, you were loving what you were doing. And it's the same feeling that I get when I get an opportunity to stand up on stage. So thank you for that. Thank you. That means the world. And I'm so happy our paths crossed all those years ago and just such a full circle moment having you on here today. And yes. it's clear that you've set yourself up for amazing things whenever you decide that there's a, a next chapter ahead. So we're just so grateful for that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same. I'm her co-host and one of her best friends, but <laughs> it, it is a mark and we're going to talk about this with you moving forward, but it is a mark of athletes that can make a transition and, and stay happy with their sport. I think it's really mm -hmm. tough to mm -hmm. leave your sport and there's ups and there's downs. And like you, it really hit me when you talked about not having resentment for the moment, right? Having joy mm -hmm. in the moment. And so if you can continue to do that, which is what she's done, you will mm -hmm. stay in the sport forever because you will be so happy in what you've accomplished yeah. and you won't have those kind of negative feelings built up. So I want, mm -hmm. I want to hear more about that from you. Um, I know that you are doing a lot of stuff with nonprofit and you view yourself as a role model in the sport, rightfully so. Um, but I want, first want to hear about your role models. So we talk about mm -hmm. Jeff Skiba a little bit and his impact in your journey moving forward. So I would love to hear about that before we move into how you are a role model. Yeah, Jeff is awesome. I mean, and it's it's so unfortunate that I only got to compete on a few teams with him because he was already at the end of his career and he's already, you know, a full career as a police officer. Um, but I remember I seen Jeff Skiba jump for the first time. It was 2014 in Arizona, actually, at the Sun Angel Classic. And I don't want to say I didn't think anything of it, but um, I didn't think anything would come from it, I guess I should say. Uh, but the dude's a beast. I mean, he went out there, I probably beat me. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm going like, to actually look up the results for that competition because he probably did. Um, but when, when you talk about people who were trailblazers and made all of this possible for us today. He's one of those guys, him and the Jerome Singletons and the Jerome Averys and the Lex Gillettes, the people who were, were doing this when it wasn't something that you could do uh, to provide for a family. Mm -hmm. These guys were out there, you know, putting in that sweat equity for all of us, for everybody that would come after them. And Jeff and I, we got to compete on the 2015 Doha World Championship team together, and then the 2016 Rio team together. And I mean, the guy's a character, first and foremost. I mean, honestly, I hate it rooming with him because he talks so much. But, <laughs> n but in the, but no, 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 no. In the best way possible, he talked so much, and I just wanted to listen. Oh. Like, it, it, like I, couldn't, I couldn't tune him out because it was so engaging and so funny. Like, like I remember Trent roomed with him when we were in Doha, actually. And Trent was like, yeah, dude, I was up all night laughing. He just kept telling stories <laughs> all night. <laughs> and it was, it was so funny, but like, that's just the type of guy he is. And he's not trying to be funny. He, mm -hmm. he is like, if, if he reminds me of Bill Burr, that's the best way oh, to describe wow. it. Just somebody with a, an intensity. And and it, it's just it, he's just a great person to be around and, and just such a fun person to to be able to spend time with. Um, I'm extremely happy that he's seen me and that he he's one of those people who realize like, oh, wow, he's something's up with his arm, <laughs> you know, because had he not I'm, I'm not sure if, you know, if if things would have happened as quickly as they did, obviously, um, but it, it's great to be able to have my story be a part of his as well. And I, and I love that <clears throat> all that I do is just an evolution of him seeing me and, and making it possible for me to be able to be a Paralympic athlete. Mm 
Mm, and you, you said it happened quickly too, which is like understatement of yeah. the year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, he, it was so he, fast, right? Like calls it out. Like, hey, there's something different with his arm. He kind of introduces you to the Paralympic movement. Mm-hmm. You go to 2015 Worlds, and as you've mentioned, you have literally been on top of the podium since that. Yeah. So you go to 2016, mm-hmm. your first Paralympics. You win gold in both high jump and long jump, and then mm-hmm. fast forward another five years to Tokyo, you win two more medals, including setting the world record in the T47 high jump that you still have. And Mm -hmm. you get silver in the long jump. And we talk about now how you start to transition into being this role model. And for Tokyo, it was Dallas Wise, who you had reached out to and introduced to Paralympic track and fields. For him to get silver behind your gold in yeah. Tokyo. So just, I mean, there's so much there, but talk to us about that Tokyo experience coming off of Rio and being so successful, but already finding your footing as a mentor and doing the same thing for Dallas that Jeff did to you and introducing him to the movement and helping him find so much success. It's, it's funny because when you talk about that duality of, you know, being a bad guy, but also being, you know, a kind person that is when it started was literally Mm -hmm. in the lead up to Tokyo. Um, after 2018, I was almost, I I mean, I literally retired for like two weeks and I was like, okay, this isn't worth it. But I was asking myself a lot of what ifs and realized like, come on, dude, there's more that you want to prove. But I had to find my motivation. I had to find my why again. And that's when I realized, like, okay, if I've accomplished everything, I just don't want anybody else to be able to accomplish what I did. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I and the and and the and the bad guy came about. And in doing so, while I was at uh, coaching at the University of Louisville alongside my coach Jeff Petersmeyer, we were watching some film, and my coach actually. Uh, we we're watching New Balance uh, High School champ, uh, National Championship and uh, just hanging out at my coach's house, eating pizza. He makes the best pizza in the world. <laughs> and <laughs> he stops the video. He was like, did you see that? And he rewinds it. And he was like, dude, I think he has the same disability as you. And we watch it again. I was like, wow, because my coach sees me more than I see myself. Mm-hmm. So it's easier for him to spot the type of, you know, movements. And I was like, wow, I think, I think you're right. So literally I think it was either that night or the next day I called, we, we called Dallas and I'm on the phone with him and I say, Hey, Oh, you know, like just cut right to it. Hey, do you have a disability by chance? And just like myself, he says, no, no, I, I don't. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, my coach and I were just watching, you know, some of your footage and you remind me a lot of myself and literally just talking through real quick of, Hey, you know, at birth, I was, my mom was 15, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck. And, you know, and before we got off the phone, he, he, you know, he was crying Mm -hmm. because he had never met anybody with the same disability as himself. And this was in 2018. So, um, you know, he's getting ready to graduate from high school and, I mean, the kid was phenomenal. I mean, I knew that it was something (laughs) that would push me, but at the same time, not being selfish in a sense of like, this guy was really good. And in bringing him into Paralympics, there was a chance that I could lose. Like, I mean, just seeing what he did without having my coach or or without being able to truly recognize how things could be optimized for him i was like wow okay so we got to get him into paralympics first and foremost but roger we got to get it into gear we got to <laughs> we got to foot to gas and then and then the following year in 2019 uh, nisha kumar comes about and is jumping like crazy as well and as we get ready for Tokyo, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that Dallas is classified to make sure that he can be out there competing because I see so much of myself in him. And I've always been a believer that if I had myself when I was at that age, the, 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 it would have just been so much different. I mean, when there's no reason that I shouldn't have went to London 2012 and won then as well, 
because I was jumping, <laughs> you know, and, and I was jumping high enough to have, I mean, I would have been the world record holder then already. Um, but I just wasn't familiar with Paralympic sport. Mm. So I made it my responsibility to be able to make sure other people who are in a position where they have, you know, uh, non-visible disabilities uh, would, would feel welcomed and feel encouraged. So, um, like I said, I do love being the bad guy, but not at the expense of, you know, that, that, that's just a, that's just an act, you know, that's mm-hmm. just, that's just what I do to get myself going. But yeah. there's nothing that I love more than being able to stand on the podium with Dallas and to be able to see, like I said, myself and him and to be able to know that he's doing something that's going to positively affect his community, that his mother, his grandmother mm. are, are proud of him in the same way that my family is of me and that, you know, the weights lifted off his shoulders the same way that it was for me. And, and it's just so phenomenal to be able to have young people like him being part of what's elevating the Paralympic movement as a whole, because he went to, you know, USC as well. And, and it's, it's just so great to be able to see so many Paralympic athletes competing at such a high level. And I'm just a huge believer that, you know, a a rising tide raises all boats Mm -hmm. and, and I never want to win because I didn't do my due diligence. I want, I want everybody out there. And like I told, like I told, um, Dallas and everybody leading up to it because as much as I love him, I said, you know, hey, I I want him to win as many silver medals as possible. That's my goal for him. I think. What's his react? Like, is he just as spicy as you? Like, is he just like shut up? Like, what's he say back? Yeah, he no, yeah, he he. It's a like a big brother, little brother type of relationship. Like, so he. But it's 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 so much fun. It's so much fun. I love the guy to death. And I, I was just on the phone with him today too. Um but yeah, it's it's so much fun to be at this point in my life and I I, I don't take the responsibility lightly. Well it's almost becoming a legacy, right? Like Jeff started it off, you carried it on, mm-hmm. Dallas will hopefully carry it on to someone else. Like it's it's mm-hmm. so cool to be a part of. And obviously you have made an impact in a large way of making, like reaching out, picking up the phone, mm-hmm. like, you know, really digging. Like you could have picked up the phone and said, hey, do you have a disability? And he could have said no. And you could have been like, okay, cool, see ya. You know, like you yeah. really took the time to dig and go, no, 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 like I see it, I'm here for you. And that, mm-hmm. you know, that takes a lot on your part and in your heart as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And you continued to do so. So yes. you had Dallas first and then enter Paris. <laughs> enter Paris. Oh, man. Which has to yeah. have had a, such a more of a special timing yeah. with family and everything mm-hmm. that happened there. We just, we want to hear all the details. And your relationship Paris was with overwhelming. Ezra as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. When I say Paris was overwhelming, when yeah. we talk about a, a weight being lifted, I, I couldn't wait for that to be over. <laughs> like... <laughs> In the best way possible, because my goodness, it was just one thing after it was just one thing after another. And um, and so much of it was good, obviously. There, there have been a lot of talks between Ezra and his parents and myself of, hey, you know, it'd be really cool if you worked with Ezra. But we knew that being remote and him being young and there, it just it just wasn't, you know, didn't make much sense. But um, it was February of last year. They reached out again and said, Hey, we're, we're, you know, looking for coaches and, and they, you know, interviewed me and they actually ended up not hiring me initially, but I, I completely understand. I completely understand. Like it was, I don't like, I don't take myself seriously. Well, wait, what me. was their reason? Um, well, they, they found another coach who was oh. in person, okay. you know, in the LA area. So it, like I said, it made sense. Um, and it wasn't working out. So literally now we're in April. Yeah, April, because it was the week leading up to Mount Sac Relays. And they say, hey, Rod, um, you know, we ended up having to let go of the other coach. Are you still interested? And of course, it's my little brother. Like, yeah, you don't even have to ask me. You can just tell me to send him workouts and I do it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and after World Championships last year, uh, Ezra and I just knew that the plan was he, he wanted to go and win three gold medals in Paris. Uh, and 
I knew that it was possible, but there was a lot of work that needed to be done. So after the bare bones training, we, you know, just started to incorporate more of, like I said, what my coach does. But fun fact, my coach ended up getting a job at USC. So I figured, oh, wow, my coach is now in L.A. and Ezra's in L.A. This could be like a Goldilocks thing. And we go through the following, you know, fall and we getting through, uh, we're, we're, we're getting ready for Paris. And I have my son at the time. And I think that's what changed everything for me because... Now, although I've always wanted so much for Ezra, now I'm looking at him and he looks the same as he did when he was eight. Like, what did, wait, what's going on? Like, and I'm looking at him, how his parents look at him and, 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 and just knowing that, wow, this is somebody's baby. Mm, like, yeah. this is, I want for him what they want for him. And, and I think that it just revitalized me in a way that I hadn't expected it to because parenthood, just like, you know, any other major life event, you're not sure how it's going to change you, how it's going to affect you. And I'm so happy that I was able to see so many positives from my child coming into this world and, and how many people's lives he's affected just by the way he's affected me. Mm-hmm. And we, we've, uh, been so excited about the challenges that Ezra had to face this year because there were some stipulations because we were able to get him admitted into USC, but there were a lot of compliance rules. So we only got to compete like three times this year Mm. leading up to the Paris games. And we had world championships in Kobe Japan in May and he actually lost. So it was something that I had to remind him, which was, Hey dude, this is all we can do is get back to the drawing board. You're in great shape. You lost because you, you, you were misstepping here and we're going to make sure that we don't misstep again, but also it should never be that close. Mm -hmm. It should have never been that close. It It should never have been attainable. And as we're getting closer and closer, his training is going phenomenal and we get to the trials and he blows it out of the water. And myself actually, I didn't initially qualify for the team. I didn't get the A standard because I um, tore my adductor while jumping. And I didn't recognize it at the time, but I just couldn't jump. And so now I'm waiting on, I had to fill out forms and ask for a discretionary pick. Um, So I'm waiting, you know, I think just a day on whether or not I'd be selected to compete in Paris. And once receiving the selection, Huge weight off my shoulders, but at the same time, it was like, this isn't how I wanted to make the team, Mm -hmm. but the how doesn't matter in my mind. You know, Um, the fact is I was selected to make the team and I just had to remind myself the same way I reminded Ezra, hey, you didn't have a good day today. You didn't have a good day yesterday, but at the end of the day, we got six weeks. You're in great shape. We just got to make sure we're healthy for Paris. And. It was so exciting, um, the, the changes that my coach and I had to, to, to go through. I was flying to L.A. once a week to train with my coach. Yeah. Um, and in doing so, I was you know able to work because Ezra would typically fly to Phoenix twice a month to work with me. But given that, you know, six weeks before the games and I was dealing with an injury, it just made sense for me to just go to L.A. every week. And it, it was so much going on at the same time. And like I said, a lot of it good. Um, but dealing with that injury was uh, a weight on me mentally. And I'll never forget um, when I'm jumping, it, uh, I, I clear the first height and I'm thinking, yes, like I'm super excited, which is so odd for me considering that like typically those opening heights I'm so stoic about, but I've not cleared a bar. I hadn't cleared a bar in five months. Like no. I just, you know, it, it wasn't something that, that was expected. And I'm counting the competitors, how many people are left in the competition, and, and I just still don't feel like myself. And it was so unfortunate because it was the moment that I had always dreamed for. Um, you know, there's 70,000 people there. My mom is there. My wife is there. My son is there. And I'm here competing in Paris, and I don't, and I know that I was injured six weeks ago but I don't feel any pain and all I'm doing is just looking up. And I've always told people, you know, I, I'm a showman. The lights can never be too bright. The crowd can never be too loud. And I'm here and I'm soaking all this in. I have a great warm ups, and 
as the competition is going on, though, I'm just not feeling like myself. I'm feeling a sense of content because I overcame so much to get to this point. It felt like the pinnacle of where I'd always want to be. And I felt like, yes, we did it. Mm. But the job wasn't done. (laughs) So, so, so I had to just continue to try to dig myself out of this hole. And it's crazy given all of the adversity that I had gone through to get to this place that there was still one more battle which was hey rod we got to tap in we got to lock in because the guy that i'm jumping against is jumping out of this war he nishad is jumping like crazy and i'll never forget though at one point in the competition there was just two people left nishad and myself and i say to myself well hey worst case at least you got silver and i was like wait what did you just say (laughs) You're like, did oh, someone float oh, out of my body oh, and float back in? Yeah, that, <laughs> that right there? Oh, no. I call myself so many names that I won't even feel comfortable saying on your Yeah, we're podcast. unfiltered, but, but not that unfiltered. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and I, I go and I clear the next bar and I walk up to my coach and he says, welcome back. Oh, wow. And, and it's crazy how apparent... It was to him. Like I said, he sees myself Mm -hmm. more than I see myself. And I can't, it's not like I'm trying to hide it, but like he knew something was going on. Um, And once that happened right there, I mean, the competition was over. There was no, I was myself again. And it felt so good to be able to go through that battle as well. And it's crazy because there, (laughs) like if people were aware of what my fitness was and and what I was capable of doing that day, there, there, the world record would have been blown to smithereens. But mm-hmm. once again, after winning the competition and knowing, hey, I'm the only person left, kind of came down off that high a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and was just super excited that, hey, I, I, I was able to win. Yeah. I was able to win. And at the end of the day, when we're competing, at the games, the goal is to win first and foremost. <laughs> we can worry about the marks later. We'll never worry about the marks after we win. Um, and it was just so exciting to be able to take my son down to the high jump pit and to oh my have gosh. my wife there in the stands as well. This was the first time that my wife got to see me compete in person uh, at, the, at the games, you know, because in Tokyo, while she was jumping, um, you know, Casual, I had to but... stay back in the yeah. States. Yeah, yeah, also... yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> A Team USA athlete um, in her own right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had to stay back in the States. And when I was competing, she couldn't be there in person either. Mm. And it was just so, so overwhelming in so many ways. And it was just something that, like I said, the pinnacle of what I could have asked for. And it was just amazing to be able to have my family there and to be able to have it all happen that way. But knowing that... Ezra was jumping two days after that yeah. was so cool because I mean, the, the, the conversations that I have with him are, are insane. And, and he motivates me a lot because I, I tell people he's like a, a golden retriever, you know, like a dog. Can you, yes. Working with him is every day. It's like, Hey, do you want to go on a walk? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's what it's like working with Ezra. It's just like, yeah, let's do it. Um, But before he went out to jump, I I remember telling him, because in my 32-year-old wisdom third game, um, (laughs) I I, I just know how big these moments really are. And we were were dealing with our own situation with Ezra, given that nobody expected him to win the 100, and he did. The only people that expected him to win was myself and Richard Brown. Even Ezra didn't expect to win the 100. But Ezra is so insane um in the best way possible he's a, he's a lot like me in that in that way that he was mad that he won the 100 and he wouldn't acknowledge it Wait. because he thought he thought this is getting in the way of my high jump because he won the 100 two days before winning high two days before the high jump so his mindset was no the job's not done i can't believe anybody even wants to talk to me about this one he didn't wear the medal <laughs> He didn't talk about it. He was just, like I said, he was mad about it because he felt like it was interfering 
with his high jump. I mean, that's how respect, kind of, you know, yeah, kind of exactly. stone cold and vibes. 100%, 100%. And I remember talking to him before we went to the track for uh, the high jump. And I said, you know, yeah, you're out there jumping for yourself, but there, there are two more people that I want you to compete for today. Just two. And that's the eight-year-old Ezra that I met. Mm -hmm. And that's for 80-year-old Ezra, mm -hmm. who's always going to remember this moment. Well. And when we're out there jumping, I think he only missed one bar the entire competition. But after he missed that bar, I brought him over. Because like I said, there's only so much coaching that I'm going to do. I say, hey, remember who you're doing this for. Mm -hmm. And after that... <sighs> No History was it. written. <laughs> That's such a good message to, I mean, anyone. Like our some community, people, like the eight and the, I feel like we always talk about do it for the, like the younger you, but yeah. you don't, think about the older you looking back on that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's Which amazing. I, I also just the remember who you are piece because I feel like we get questions all the time of like athletes that get so nervous behind the blocks or before they're, before they're about to start. Mm -hmm. And it's it's 100% that. There's literally in that moment, nothing else you can do to be more prepared mm -hmm. except remember who you are. And I just 100%. love that. That is yeah. amazing. I can't, I mean, it was just so fun getting to watch both of you guys go through that. You get your third consecutive Paralympic gold. You get yeah. to watch Ezra get it two <laughs> days later. It, it, your story is just amazing, Roderick. And I think we, we agree, Katie and I, but everyone listening, that your legacy is going to be yeah. so far beyond just your accomplishments <laughs> in, in track and field. And we want to go into a little bit more of a fun segment now. So this is our uh, power yes. play segment, which is AK, just rapid yeah. fire. Uh, just, okay. a cool, just a way cooler name. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about branding, as you know. Okay, so these are a whole bunch of random things, but kind of more on the fatherhood side and, and family side and things like that. So first one, what has been your most unexpected experience of fatherhood so far? Um, most unexpected experience of fatherhood, honestly, for me, oh, I got to, I got to help catch him. That was the craziest thing. That, that, oh, wow. So Dang. The, the thing that was so unexpected for me was that like, they literally just let everybody do this. Like everybody gets to have the best thing in the world. It's mm -hmm. crazy. And, and I think that that overwhelming feel of feeling of just like love and joy and euphoria was just like just indescribable to anybody who's never had a child you won't understand until you have one and it just made so much sense in that moment of wow this is the best thing ever and so many people get to experience this and it feels like a it feels like a fraternity now when i get to talk about other people and i get to see their kids and they and i and I, I it just makes so much sense to me i love it i love it that's amazing did he like you said you caught him like this might be a dumb question oh, yeah so I got to, I got to help. yeah so like what well, <laughs> they so actually they call, just they shoot it, out yeah. across yeah. the room and you go yeah. heads and someone just yeah. reaches <laughs> i was like yeah. i know that but you know what i mean yeah. i'm like the way you're like yeah. caught him like yeah no the doctor dropped him and i caught him no um, <laughs> um but it was crazy because I'm I'm typically not for any of like when like I I can't watch Doctor Pimple Popper or dentist videos or anything like that. Yeah. But this is so much different. So any man out there listening to this, 100. percent This is just vastly different. If you feel like you're squeamish, I promise you, you will not be in this moment. It is just so much different. If you have the opportunity to help catch your son or daughter, do it because it, it's it's phenomenal. It is crazy i think the one thing that caught me off guard though oh geez his head was just purple <laughs> like i mean it looked like the wall behind you oh, like a God. blue purple and i looked at the doctor the doctor didn't react i was like okay so this is, so normal. This is normal so we're good we're not sensing <laughs> yeah, exactly oh, it was crazy but yeah i got to help pull him out and it was it was crazy it was crazy wow it's more of like a, a slow catch yeah. a slow yes, pull out. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. okay yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> biggest thing that you and Ty are the most competitive about with each other as Olympic athletes? <laughs> mm -hmm. Honestly, it's just random things. Like it, it, it can be anything. Um, we try not to be, but like we're doing a puzzle together right now 
she's done most of it. I've done the edges and like help fill in, but like we, we really know our strengths and weaknesses. And I think that the, the, the biggest thing that we're competitive about is we call it bringing stuff to the table. And it's mm-hmm. like, who brought what into the relationship? Oh. Like, as far as like, Oh, you know, we didn't watch this show until I brought it up. So like, so like, <laughs> um, so we just finished watching a show called, or we're in the middle of watching a show called high potential, uh, with one of my favorite actresses. And Ty says, yes, I brought this to the table. So like, we like, we're most competitive on who brings the most like enjoyment into the home. That's if a that great makes sense. I feel thing like that's to be where, competitive like about. Exactly. Like, Cause you all win. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 So like if, if for example, if neither of us ever bowled and I was like, Hey, let's start bowling and we love it, it's like I brought that to yeah. the table. Well, yes. <laughs> I did this. I love that. Yes. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite Rodney story? My favorite Rodney story. Oh this is tough. Mm. Coming up on a year that personality is really know, starting to come year. out. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. There's so many. I'm just thinking of the. Just started walking. That's fun. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> You're getting help. Oh yeah, yeah I'm getting help. She's giving. It's, yeah, life. She's line. bringing this to the table. I'm just <laughs> yeah. letting you know. <laughs> yeah. So 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 far, recent recency bias is kicking in. Um, but he he just started. So so he just started walking two weeks ago. Um, the week of he just started taking a couple of steps. Nothing crazy, you know, not a major life changing event or anything like that. <laughs> but um, we always stay after church in the evening just to hang out and we get done with church and we uh, just set him down. And the dude just starts running, just like literally went from taking a couple of steps to just basically running. I had never expected anything like that, especially considering that he. I mean, his parents, I'm not that surprised. <laughs> yeah. Like. <laughs> Elite it was, jeans it, over here. It, it, was, it was funny because, like I said, he had taken a couple of steps. And, like, the way that the church has the classes set up is for the infants. And I love this church because every child has their own, like, caretaker, which is great. Um, but they have a room for infants, a room for crawlers, and a room for walkers. And we're saying to ourselves, yeah, he took a couple of steps this week. I don't know if we should put him in the walkers class. But I was like, let's just take him to the walkers class because if anything, it'll probably do him some good to see other kids walking. So we take him to the walker uh, classroom and then he's running that like literally once the class is over, like what the heck? Like, <laughs> yeah, he probably got annoyed that all the kids yeah. were walking better than him. And he was like, no, I'm doing this. <laughs> oh, man. It's yeah. And then, um, I, I think that uh, other other favorite memories are like uh, when when we were in Paris, um, and there's the uh, the long jump going on, and everybody's getting their claps going, oh, and claps. then he's sitting on my lap and he starts clapping oh. with them. It was just so so cool to be there in those moments uh, where, um, you know, he's not aware of the situation, but he's aware of himself and aware of you know just the few things and just to see how beautiful it is to. To see his little mind working is so much fun. Yeah. And you're aware of it, even though if he's not, like yeah. you recognize in that moment, you're getting oh, to share yeah. something so special with your son. Yeah. And people said, oh, why are you bringing him? He's not going to remember. I don't care. You remember. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm doing this for exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. I'm doing this for me. And, and, and so much of, you know, these first four years is just really doing it for me, doing it for my wife. And, and we can't take any of these moments for granted because tomorrow just really never is promised. And, uh, hopefully we never have to experience that, but I never want to say to myself, it's, it it comes from, so we're doing rapid fire and I'm telling stories. (laughs) Such a dad, such a dad. Um, but, uh, he's, (laughs) he, um, like we we had we had a puppy and we lost our puppy oh. it got oh sick and God. passed and I remember saying to myself wow he never even had peanut butter we didn't get to go to a dog park <laughs> and and I was like I refuse for anything like that to ever be the case so no my son is going to go to Paris gonna we're going to go to Disney things. we're going to do all of the things yeah. because tomorrow's not promised yeah. and we're, we're and and if nothing else we're going to have pictures videos and all these memories for yeah. ourselves amen. Okay, so 
Who is your favorite bad boy showman athlete in another sport? In another sport? Mm. It probably have to be like um what's it called? I like Tom Brady a lot. People don't look at it that way, but like he's very uh I but I guess that's probably just competitiveness, you know? I, I guess it can't it can't, it. it can't just yeah, it can't just be somebody who's ultra competitive. But I feel like that line gets so blurred mm-hmm. between that um outside of that. I'm just not too I mean, you kind of already outside answered of wrestling, it, to be honest. Like, outside of Stone Cold Steve Austin yeah. and Tom Brady. Those guys are athletes. Or those yeah. guys are definitely yeah. athletes. I don't care what you say. Yeah. WWE yeah, is I mean, like yeah, insane. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Jumping off those ladders yeah. and stuff like that, that's insane. <laughs> just... I'm over here, as much of this housework stuff as I do, those ladders are terrifying to me. Like, I can't imagine just Clean doing your that body. on a regular basis. Like, yeah, <laughs> just do a flip. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay next one if there was a dream company that you could represent or work with what would that company be a dream company oh probably home depot <laughs> <laughs> It'd be so cool you would okay i can just pick you can do your hair orange yeah and then yeah, wear yeah, the yes, apron 100%. and it's exactly. perfect how do you not already <laughs> have a relationship well, aren't they an olympic sponsor no, cool. they're a paralympic olympic so. sponsor i think yeah, I think you're right. Well, yeah, Home, Home Depot. Depot will be sick. Uh, we'll be tagging them in this. <laughs> yes. I think we're kidding. <laughs> oh, I, I hope you're not kidding. No, I don't no it's kidding. happening. They're we're being collabed. We're here to make things happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, well, perfect segue into the final question before we go into our last three questions. Um, what is your ideal hair color style that you've ever had? Or favorite? Ooh, honest, my, my favorite still is just the simple ones. Mm. Um, so I did, like, this time of, time of year, I like the, the, the natural color. So, like, I did a ginger, like, a really nice just ginger. Mm. It's actually in one of these pictures up here. <laughs> um, and then um, I think my next favorite is probably the magenta that I did at World Championships last year. I love the magenta. Um, just was really, really nice. And I did turquoise in Tokyo. I like the solid colors a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm. Um the obviously the Picasso was crazy, yeah. but it's not something that I would just wear. Whereas like the magenta, I felt like was subtle enough to still pop. Um, but I think the magenta for sure is something I could just see myself like rocking. Yeah, I love it. Well, it's so fun for us. We're always like, all right, what's he coming out with? Yeah. What do yeah. we got? Yeah. <laughs> like it's just that extra, exactly. again, that extra people, level of entertainment yeah. that you bring, which is yeah. so fun. And instead of people saying like, oh, are you going to be competing in L.A.? They say, oh, what are you going to do your hair like in LA? Like, that's a (laughs) mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) That's amazing. So, I'm not sure what it's going to be, but yeah, it's going to be a conversation starter, is the goal. That's, hey, we have (laughs) no doubt. We have absolutely no doubt. All right, that is the end of our rapid fire. So, we're going to go into, we ask every single one of our guests these same three questions. So, the first one is what is a moment within the sport of track and field that brings you the most amount of joy? Um, for myself, I, I think this year was was very intense as a Paralympian because the the Paris Games just had such a good turnout. I think that for myself, it it was really just being able to see all my fellow team members live that dream of having a full stadium mm. watch them do what they do. Hey, bud. Um, yes. And <gasps> oh, we wanted this so this, badly. <laughs> yeah, he has this PVC pipe. He doesn't get to. He just gets random things. We so, like, love that. We bought. Yeah, you know, we bought him a PVC pipe and some keys off of Amazon. Some just regular like John Deere keys. <laughs> he loves them. Um, He'll be sponsored by Home Depot. Too. Yeah, I mean it's perfect. Who <laughs> exactly. needs Fisher Price? You're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it, for, for, yeah, it was really just being able to see so many people live that dream because mm-hmm. I know what it means to me to to be able to put on that show and to to okay, you can't touch mommy's puzzle, buddy. <laughs> um, to to be able to live that dream of wow, the stadium is full, everybody's here to watch me compete, yeah. and to hear the crowd roar, roar, and it, it's. It's something that's that we've never got to experience as Paralympic athletes and, and myself being, like I said, a team captain, uh, just being able to 
be out there. And like I told them after they selected me, my goal was to be the biggest, biggest Team USA Paralympic fan there could be. So when I was out there watching long jump, I had my face painted. Like it was, it was fun. It was fun. And I, and I think that it was so cool to be able to, to watch them live that dream. Oh, that stadium is just, I got to go and watch yeah. with the limp. It's just, it's so open. It's purple. Like it just was so the purple was legendary. Nice, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, same question, which I feel like we're cheating off based off how Rodney just came to your lap, but your <laughs> favorite memory or moment outside your sport that's brought you the most amount of joy. Yeah. Honestly, it's just, it's just the regular stuff. Mm. I, I think that it, it's, he's allowed me to slow down in so many ways that um, we were excited to come home to sleep in and go and get pancakes at mm -hmm. our favorite diner. And that's it. Like just the, the small things on a day-to-day -day basis. I see, you know, I try to remind myself a lot that at the end of the day, he's extremely happy with how that day went. He got mm -hmm. to hang out with his mom. He got to go with his dad to Home Depot. <laughs> He got to get a new PVC pipe and, and he's sleeping happy and comfortably. And regardless of what my day is like, regardless if I feel like I got everything done or nothing done at all, I just feel so confident and content in knowing that, that he's happy. Yeah, so true. Puts everything into perspective. All right, final question. If you had to pick one word that encompasses your mindset, your attitude, or something that you're working on moving forward, what would that word be and why? Appreciative. Mm -hmm. Again, um, I, I just, I'm just extremely happy to be at this point in my life. And, and yeah, there are always going to be the other things that attribute to that appreciation, but, but appreciation first and foremost, um, I just couldn't be happier to be here. Couldn't be happier to have my son, my wife, to be where I'm at in my life right now. I'm just so grateful for all of it, all of it. And I've, it's been such a big motivator for me. And I don't expect that to change. Mm -hmm. Well, we are obviously so appreciative of your time <laughs> here on Unfiltered Waters. And it's been, Missy met you. I haven't gotten to meet you in person, but just your, your perspective and your presence and just your mindset on life is something that I know I will take away and I know all of our listeners will too. So just want to thank you so much for the time. Thank you. We so appreciate thank you, you Rod. That was amazing. Yeah. We're sending all our love to the family and thank you as Katie same, said. Just, same. Oh, so grateful. And hopefully it's not too long before we both run into you. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you all based out of? We're again? in Nashville. Nashville. Oh, okay. Wow. I was that's not far from where I used to live. It's far from me now. <laughs> I was like, uh. <laughs> I, used to, I used to live in Louisville. If I used to live oh, in Louisville amazing. still, that'd be Super different. Super close, yeah. 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 Whenever you're mm -hmm. out here, just let us know. And yeah, please. Yeah, Especially for sure. Yeah. Yes. Heck yeah. <laughs> My favorite part of the yeah. podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. The dude has flown everywhere. Like, he's gotten his own mileage number and everything right now. It's amazing. So. Oh, we're sending you guys all the best. Thank you so much Thank again. You. And we will talk to you super soon. 